Greetings to all in the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ as we gather for worship this morning on this second Sunday of Easter. It's good to be together and I want to first start with the official call to the congregational meeting. This is the second required call to the congregational meeting that will occur immediately at the end of this worship service and the call has been uh, for the purpose of electing three elders to the session and therefore uh, there will be no other business that is appropriate for the meeting at this time uh, and we will move to the election. Uh, nominations from the floor uh, are and will be in order but uh, if you wish to, to make a nomination from the floor other than the three, uh, the slate of three who, whose names have been proposed by our nominating committee then just uh, it is important that you will have checked with the person you're nominating uh, for that for that purpose. I want to uh, invite Warren Jones now to come and to bring uh, uh, information about an important interfaith event that's occurring this week. Good morning. I uh, just wanted to make everybody aware we've got uh, an exciting uh, Wednesday night program coming up this Wednesday. The Dialogue Institute of Mississippi is going to host a traditional Ramadan interfaith intercultural dinner here at Fondren. Uh, they will we'll gather at 620 for a short program and then have dinner after uh, catered by Aladdin's at sundown in the tradition of Ramadan. The meal's free, but uh, reservations are limited to 30, so uh, please sign up. There's a sheet in the narthex, uh, it, and uh, it's just right out here. And uh, just want to uh, say this is going to be a great opportunity to promote friendship, dialogue, and peace in our community over a lovely meal. Uh, so uh, the uh, sign up will be through noon on Tuesday, so uh, they, they do uh, want to know me there so they know uh, uh, what to bring. And then we've also got a bunch of other uh, Wednesdays together that the SIM has put together coming up in April and May. We'll have details. We're still kind of finalizing the dates for a couple of uh, uh, those events, but we're going to have a grill night. We're going to have a wine and cheese uh, poetry reading night and a couple of other exciting things coming up. So look forward to seeing everybody on Wednesdays uh, coming up in April and May. Thank you all. I just, uh, it may not be necessary, but I want to remind everybody about the important celestial events uh, that are coming up. Uh, first, uh, the moon was visible last night and the next time the moon is going to be visible again will be tonight. <laughs> but, and a word of explanation. You know there are lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. And so a lunar eclipse is, uh, occurs uh, when the earth shadows light from the sun onto the moon. And so the moon will be bright and then it will go dark. And a solar eclipse is when the moon comes between the earth and the sun. But there's a third one that you need to know about, and that's when the sun comes between the moon and the earth, and that's called the apocalypse. <laughs> uh, I think it goes uphill from here. <laughs> Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God.
Let us lift up our hearts to God. Peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. It is like precious oil on the head, the blessing of the Lord. Please stand for our opening hymn, number 234.
Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and mercy. God will not always chide and hold his anger forever. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God seek to remove our sins and transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Be at peace. We rejoice in God's eternal love and mercy. Thanks be to God. Let us now share signs of Christ's peace. scriptures. Let's bow together in prayer. Gracious God, we pray that now as we turn to your holy scriptures, we may receive once more the light and the love of Jesus Christ. For we pray in Christ's name. chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. As I read, listen for the word of God. Now, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. But everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The, new, uh, the lesson from the Gospel is recorded in John chapter 20, 
21. 20, 19, beginning with the 19th verse. When it was evening, are we going to have that? That would be great because I was enjoying listening to the rehearsal. No, 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 we're going to have that.
on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger in here and see my hands reach out your hand and put it in my side do not doubt but believe thomas answered him my lord and my god jesus said to him have you believed because you have seen me blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Let us sing. The hymn is number 240. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks. <laughs>
essential elements in Christian worship is joy. But goes along with that, with that joy, is also mirth. And we've had a little of that this morning, and we may have some more, especially if I forget to preach the sermon. <laughs> I'll try not to. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love the high Sundays of the year. Easter, Pentecost, Transfiguration Sunday, All Saints Sunday. I love them. All the ones that Hallmark has not managed to figure out quite how to commercialize successfully. But don't worry, they're working on it. In addition, there are other Sundays called Low Sundays. Low Sundays that I also love. And this is one, the second Sunday of Easter, this Low Sunday. I really resonate spiritually with the readings. I miss very much those once or twice a year attendees from Easter. God bless them. <laughs> you may know that the British use acronyms even more than we do. And they also use snarky straight talk. They speak of CE Christians or Christians who are Christian on Christmas and Easter. I saw a cartoon on that very theme of a couple who were shaking hands with the pastor after the Easter worship service. And commenting on the sermon, the husband said to the minister, you're in a rut. <laughs> Same message over and over. Yeah, I'm weird. I love Stewardship Sunday. Morning worship on Christmas Day. And Stewardship Sunday. Did I mention Stewardship Sunday? Robert Frost's famous poem about second bests called Fire and Ice captures it, I think. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to know that for destruction, ice is also great and will suffice. On the second Sunday of Easter, the Easter community can take a cue straight from John's Gospel to feel like it is gathered more closely. Do some of you feel that way? I do. Gathered more closely. The followers of Jesus had ridden the pitching, tossing Leviathan of heart-rending, soul-wrenching experience that was recalled through the Last Supper, the arrest, the torture, the kangaroo court conviction, and the execution of their beloved rabbi. They had only just begun to grieve his death when they were once more rocked and socked to hear that he was alive once more. What in the world did that mean? They were hopeful, but some were, and many even remain to this day, doubtful. What a deep and emotionally, spiritually touching reassurance it is that he shows us that he really understood their doubts and their fears. In his conversation with Thomas, does he not show that he understands? The Easter community regathered first in fear. But when the Lord appeared to them once more, he gave them both peace and courage. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. The Christian community has many personality traits, just as there were different traits among the disciples of Jesus. J 
just as all of us have different personality traits. Some of our personality traits in the church are expressed with two Greek words from Scripture. And let's go into it. The first word is ecclesia, or ecclesia, and it means ones who are called out, called out of the world. We often talk about how we are a called in a gathered community. Whatever life work that we engage in is our call as well. Also, how we function within a family or a circle of friends, that's part of our call. God's Holy Spirit engages us after He has grabbed our attention and our devotion. The Holy Spirit invites us and urges us to take up holy service for the Lord with everything we do in our lives. Part of this is being brought together the same way the first disciples of Jesus were brought together by Him. And when He had died and when his tomb was found empty in the morning of the third day they gathered again in fear and despair and then he appeared to them they worshiped you would too and he speaks to them a very important message that sets the tone for any present day easter community as the father has sent me so i send you he said to I mentioned Greek terms in our Christian personality. I looked, but I didn't see any of you actually roll your eyes when I said that. I saw a few beads of sweat that were forming on your temples, though. Uh, please don't worry too much. Uh, the lesson will be short and painless. And you'll have a new anchor to help you hold on in some future spiritual squall that threatens you when you recall this short lesson. Now you've heard the word ecclesiastic or ecclesiastical. I know you have. And you know the word means something about church, right? Because it floated into English as a Greek transliteration. Church is ecclesia. It comes from the word ecclesia. It means called out. Called out of the world. Called together. Called to come together. To assemble. To gather. We spend so much time in the church agonizing to get people just to come. A friend back in seminary who grew up in the Baptist church remembered one of his huge disappointments with his childhood church. And we all have them, don't we? He remembered how much emphasis they had put on what he called packing the pews. Pack the pews. Pack the pews. He got tired of it. And he was refreshed, therefore, when he found the Presbyterian Church, which sometimes seems not to care at all <laughs> whether anyone at all is in worship service. Well, that's not really true, as you know. And I'll testify that it certainly is not true with me. But do I spend too much time on the aspect of ecclesia, coming together, calling out of the world, gathering? The church is the people who hear the call of the world, of God to come out of the world, come away, get together, refresh, worship God, study, share in fellowship with each other, build each other up. The ecclesia means one's called out of the world. You got that lesson now, I'm sure. However, here in John's Gospel on the second Sunday of Easter, come out is not the message. Hmm. Instead, the message is go. The message is go. Just as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Go. The second Greek word you're learning today is apostolon, apostolon. The church is called, but the church is also sent. Apostolon means ones who are sent, sent ones. They were not called apostles until after the resurrection. 
And since Judas had killed himself, there were not even 12 apostles. There were only 11. Later, a replacement would be named, but that's not for today. And so the church members are both ones who are called out and ones who are sent back. We, the church members, are both. Incidentally, as I said before, the very word church is uh, a translation of ecclesia. Now, after the resurrection, the church became missional. And it became international, rapidly international. Jesus' followers were sent out everywhere, and we are too. I think sometimes, midweek, of where all the church members are functioning in the region around here. I know some of you work miles from Jackson, and I think about where you are working and what is going on in your lives. Well, of course, missional means more than missions. We emphasize the essential nature and vocation of the church as God's people called and sent. Missional means the engaging of the culture with the gospel and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, many congregations equate the word missions with a missions committee, with uh, money that's budgeted, you know, uh, once a year, and the bills paid uh, when we get the invoices, or perhaps with short-term mission trips, or with missionaries who are supported or various projects of compassion and evangelism in the community and the world. Such activities are indeed missional. But mission thinking in Matthew 25 congregations cannot be delegated to one committee or limited to one small group of congregational members or activities. Instead, to be an apostle on church There needs to be a group mentality, a practiced behavior in individual lives and communal life. I'll ask you sincerely, do any of you have a concept of sentness? We do from time to time. I know we, we are convicted by something that turns our heart and we want to act. And so sometimes we are convicted. If you are convicted and infected, would you please infect other people? <laughs> Do you mind? The original Christians who had inherited Jesus' personal sending forth of the disciples who became the apostles after his death and resurrection, they did have a concept of sentness. Our missional mentality sees life itself as being sent. Jesus said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. We have purpose. It is to go into the world to others, to share God's grace and love that we have received. Sentness is in contrast with the self-concept that we have too often focused on as church people for generations. That church is about coming, showing up, attending, involvement, participation. Well, it's true. As I made clear, church is communal, a gathered body. But the church is by nature both gathered and then missional, sent. Apostolon, that's you and me. Mark chapter 3 verse 14 says, And Jesus appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. Be with and sent. Communal 
and missional. Growing a missional mentality does not diminish our emphasis on participation with God's gathered people. It wonderfully adds balance. Going into all the world with the love of the risen Christ requires the major mental shift of moving from seeing oneself as a receiver of blessing from congregational activities from a pastor to a giver of blessing. How many givers of blessings are here today? Ones who give blessings sent to be blessing in the world. And the world is so hungry and thirsty for your blessing. It's to shift from being a sheep to being a shepherd. Churches say they want to grow, but it doesn't happen until their people know that they are sent to give God's blessing to others in many ways. We have been called out of the world to organize and to build the church for sin. I have taught recently and will again that the Presbyterian Church is an organized church for the purpose of attending to God's people in the world so that people's needs can be met. That's the purpose of our organization. The first makes no sense without the other. Being called to gather, such as at meetings and worship, spending time on spiritual matters and praying for one another is all for one purpose which is learning to give ourselves to others as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Today is Low Sunday. Today is also called Little Easter. Isn't that sweet? Every Sunday of the year is a Little Easter. Don't forget that. It's always about the resurrection. The sermon title, Second Best, turned out not to be very accurate today, and I apologize. I sometimes turn in a sermon title before the sermon goes a different direction. To be honest, every chance we get that we have to get together brings some new energy, some new information or inspiration for sharing the love and blessings of Jesus Christ with others inside our doors and beyond our doors. It's why we worship God on this corner starting 94 years ago and why God's people have worshipped for millennia. Now to God who is able to do far, far more than anything we would ever ask of Him. To God be all glory in the church by Christ Jesus forever and ever.
having received so generously from God's gracious hand, we in turn are invited to come and to bring both ourselves and our gifts to God for the work of the church to share the good news about Christ. Let us offer ourselves and our gifts. When we were slaves in Egypt, you broke the bonds of our oppression 
brought us through the sea to freedom and made covenant to be our God. By a pillar of fire, you led us through the desert to a land flowing with milk and honey and set before us the way of life. You spoke of love and justice in the prophets and in the word made flesh, you lived among us, manifesting your glory. He died that we might live and is risen to raise us to new life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. You are truly holy, God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. By your power, he broke free from the prison of the tomb and at his command, the gates of hell were opened. The one who was dead now lives. The one who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation. The lamb upon the throne, the one ascended on high, is with us always as he promised. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and wine from the gifts that you have given us and we celebrate with joy the redemption that is won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. <coughs> Gracious God, Pour out now your Holy Spirit upon us and upon your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with him, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Today we intercede for your blessed church, O oh God, and ask you to fill it with all grace and love of Jesus Christ. Help it to be your true servants in the world. Today we pray for those who are in grave danger for their lives, especially in Gaza, especially the children, especially those who are starving to death for the lack of food and resources. We pray, O oh God, that you may inspire willing hearts to suspend hostilities and to reach out to care for and to feed and nourish all those who are in great need. We pray also for all those in the world who are refugees and who are moving around in danger for their own lives so often, traveling long distances with little food and great need. We pray for them today, O oh God. Nourished at this table, dear God, may we know Christ's redemptive love and live a new life in Him. Help us who recognize our Lord in the breaking of bread to see and serve Him in all whose lives are broken. Give us who are fed at His hand grace to share our bread with the hungry and with the hungry of heart. Keep us faithful in Your service till Christ comes in final victory. And we shall feast with all your saints who have gone before us and for whose lives we give you deep thanks in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, all glory and honor be yours, mighty Father, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, now and forevermore. Amen. And let God's people pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, he broke it, and said to them, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took up the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it, for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you show forth the saving death of the Lord Jesus until he comes again. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. The worshipers are invited to come choir first and to gather around the table. This is not the table of the Presbyterian Church. It's the Lord's table. And to this table are invited all persons who place their trust and hope in the mercy of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, this is my body.
closing hymn today is number 610, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Bit of irony there. <laughs>
All in favor of this slate of nominees for the service on the session as elders in the church, please say aye. 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 And the opposition say nay. Hearing none, the, uh, the ayes have it and the slate is elected and we, I will be in touch with those who have been uh, elect, duly elected to uh, uh, form a, uh, a class for uh, elder education. Uh, an elder in the church asked me if uh, it was uh, all right for others to attend the class, and I said, yes, of course it is. And so uh, there may be others who will want to attend. I do not have a time and place in mind. I will focus on uh, the three to make sure that we can get uh, together our, our schedules together, and then the, uh, the, the, the work will uh, be announced going forward. Uh, it won't be more than 50 or 60 classes. So. <laughs> well, they, they didn't tell you that? They, they didn't mention that? Oh, okay. it, will be it will be three to four classes. Now, it's uh, appropriate to close the meeting with prayer. Is there a motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Let us pray. God, we are your servants. You have called us all and chosen us to come to you and to receive your eternal gifts of life and hope and joy in the gospel. We're so grateful for the life and death and resurrection of Christ our Lord. We depend on him. and We are graced by his love eternal. Hear us now as we pray with thanksgiving for your many blessings and for sending us out into the world as his servants. Through Christ we pray always. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.